So continuing with our pre-quantum ideas, to, on this video we're just going to go through the atom. So early tests on the atom was done by Balmer, and he noticed that if you take a low pressure gas, like hydrogen, here I've got hydrogen, and excite it, it gives off light right here. And if you look at that spectrum of it, you don't get a black body spectrum. Since this is a low pressure gas, I actually did that. I plugged it into this device right here, which puts a high voltage, which sends electrons up and down and excites the gas. And if you take that light and look at the spectrum of it, by putting it through either a prism or a diffraction grating, you get the picture on the screen. So what you see in there is, if I spread this thing out, you'll notice that there was a red line, a red line right here. This is wavelength across here. Larger wavelength is this way. This is larger wavelength. And then you probably also saw a blue one in there. Blue one over here. And then next to the blue, there was a purple one. Pretty close to the blue. It's a purple one right here. Now, there was even a more purple one, but we can't see it in that picture. I couldn't even see with my eyes right there. So you see these three lines. These are... They gave a name to these three lines. They called this H alpha, H beta, and H gamma. And Balmer, at the wavelengths of these, you could measure the wavelength of it. This was like 656 nanometers. This was like 486 nanometers, and this violet was like 434 nanometers. And there are actually more, it actually, there's an infinite number of them, but our eyes only see within this range. You go any further and we're up into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. But Balmer came out with an equation for the wavelength of these. And the, so this was Balmer. Balmer. He said the wavelength in nanometers, he said, is equal to some constant, C2, times n squared all over n squared minus 2 squared. And this is where n can be, well, it can't be 2 because you can't have 0 in the denominator, so it starts at 3, 4, 5, dot, 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 forever. Where C1 is actually 364, 364 nanometers. Right here. Okay, and so you'll notice that this red one, this is the case where n is 3. So if you plug in over here, 3, that's 9 over 9 minus 4. So that's 9 over 5. So it's 9 fifths times that number is that number right there. This one right here, this blue line, would be n equal 4. So if you plug in n equal 4 here, you've got uh, 364 times 16 over 16 minus 4 and so on, all the way up. This keeps going right there. Uh, okay, so, so those, these were called the Balmer lines, right? And it's very important astronomically because hydrogen dominates the universe. And so uh, sometimes you get these, if you're looking at certain galaxies, you see a strong line here, and you can use that for the Doppler effect, and you can get the speed of, of galaxies and so on. Okay, this was done in about 1885, right here. But later people saw other line, other ones that were outside the, the uh, visible part of the spectrum. 
someone by the name of Patchen, P-A-C-H-E-N, saw another whole sequence of lines in hydrogen, but they were over here in the infrared part of the spectrum. And he has his own formula, N in nanometers is equal to, he called it C3, times N squared all over N squared minus 3 squared, where n can only be 4, 5, 6, da, 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 where c3 is equal to 820, 820, 820 nanometers. So these are getting much longer wavelength. Longer wavelength is in the infrared. Okay, and then there was someone else here, bracket. Again, he has another one in nanometers. This is C4 times n squared over n squared minus 4 squared, where n is equal to 5, 6, 7, da, 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 where C4 is equal to, C4 is equal to 1,460, 1,460 nanometers. That was also in the infrared even further down. Even another one right here. P F U N D. D. I'm not sure how you pronounce that right here, but this one would be nanometers equals C five. N squared all over N squared minus five squared, where N starts at six, seven, eight. Da, 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 da where C5 is even larger. That's 2,280 nanometers. Well, it looks like there could even be one up the other way, too. Someone by the name of Lineman. He got one up here in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. This is C1 times n squared all over n squared minus 1 squared, where n can be 2, 3, 4, da, 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 da. And where C1 is just 91 nanometers. So, so you're well past the optical part. And stuff. You'll notice you'll never find another one up further because we're already down to n squared minus 1 squared. But this... <laughs> actually goes on forever. So we could actually give everyone in the world their own series if we wanted to. Right? You know? But one guy says, Rydberg says, you know, I can combine everyone's equation into just one equation. He called it, uh, he said, one over the wavelength instead of the wavelength right here. That's equal to R some constant, times 1 over nf squared minus 1 over ni squared, where this is now in meters. I should just say meters. And r has the constant, uh, I think it's 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the plus 7. Uh, I just wanted to make sure right here. I think it's just 10 to the 7. Yeah, and the units are 1 over meter. Has to be, because this has no units, and this is in meters right here. Now, what is NF and NI right here? Well, NF, for this series, NF equals 1, NF equals 2, N, sorry, NF equals 3, and F equals 4, 5, 6, so on, and NI, NF has to be less than NI, or NI has to be bigger than NF, or NI has got to be bigger than NF. So if you wanted to talk about this one, the alignment up here, again, you have one constant in there, 10 to the 7th, 
since nf is 1, you just put 1 in there. And for ni, you put in all the other numbers bigger than 1. So ni can be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. For this series, that's 2, and that's every number bigger than 2. And for patching right here, that's 3, and that's all the numbers bigger than 3. So, so this is kind of a, when we come out with a final measure of the hydrogen atom, we better explain this equation right here, this Rydberg equation right here. This was in 18, say, late 1800s right here. Well, the, one of the first models of the atom was actually by J.J. Thompson after he discovered the electron. And his model, it was, you probably heard about it in chemistry, it's called the plum pudding model. Plum pudding model. And what he said is, well, if it's hydrogen, you only have one electron in there, but if it's, if it's some other atom, you have more electrons, but you have an electron in there because they had discovered the electron and knew it was a particle, but they thought everything else was just kind of a pudding right here. Where this size of this whole thing is about an angstrom, say 10 to the minus 10 meters. So that was his first, and now the only thing is, how do you get these frequencies over here? You know, if you were to take this electron and move him over to the side a little bit, he'd want to come back right here because this positive pudding would pull him back this way, right? There's more positive on this side. And he would oscillate. The only thing is, he's not going to oscillate at these frequencies. You know, there's no way you're going to get these frequencies out of it. But it was the very first model right here. And uh, so it actually took, this was about 1900 or so. And then uh, Rutherford says, you know, why don't we check this model out by taking, he took some really thin gold foil, gold foil, really thin, uh, one millionth of a meter, one micron thick, and said, let's throw alpha particles at it, alpha particles. Now they knew... Alphas, at the time, they knew because alphas are emitted in radioactive decay. We know what they are now. They didn't know what they were then. Nowadays, there are two protons and two neutrons. They're usually emitted on big atoms, like uranium or some of the other big atoms when they decay. They give off these particles. They knew they were they're quite big. Compared to an electron, they're close to 10,000 times bigger than an electron. So now he says, why don't we throw, put a radioactive source here and, and hit a beam of alphas at this thin gold foil. And I just want to see how much they deflect going through that foil. And what we can have is a screen over here, say zinc sulfide, because when the alpha hits it and produces a little flash of light, and I see a little dot there, and then I can see one here and here. And so you're throwing a beam through here. You can see how much they all deviate by going through this gold foil. Now, when you try to calculate using the plum pudding model, where they all go, almost all of them should just go straight through. Matter of fact, the number you'd expect to see bouncing back or going through more than 90 degrees, the number you should see where theta is bigger than 90 degrees divided by the number you have incident, incident, Incident. How about if we just say number incident? Well, the number that bounced back should be very, very small. It should be on the order of 10 to the minus 3,500. That's literally impossible. This would be like shooting a cannon shell through a piece of tissue paper and saying how many of them come back. That's probably what you're looking at right there. This is, which means it will never happen. The only thing is, when they actually did this experiment, the amount they had that went through more than 90 degrees was, so this is calculated, calculated, 
But the amount they got back experimentally was 10 to the, sorry, 10 to the minus 4. So this was measured. This is a big difference, yeah, infinitely difference right here. How could you possibly get some coming back? And so Rutherford said the only way you can do that is if you have a compact nucleus. The, the positive isn't kind of a pudding out here. You have a compact nucleus. So this thing gave you a, a compact nucleus. Nucleus. And he said the size of the nucleus is about one ten thousandth the size of the atom. So he said, if this is the atom, the nucleus, the size of it, size, is about one over a hundred thousand the size of the atom. Right here. So it's compact. That means a few of them would bounce back because they'd run into that solid nucleus. Okay, so this set up a much better model by Bohr, Niels Bohr, one of the giants of quantum mechanics right here. What he did is he says, you know, I have my own model right here, and I just, we'll just, he has four postulates for his model of the atom. His model of the atom is the atom looks kind of like a solar system now. So he said, first of all, yeah, you have, here's the nucleus right here, the positive nucleus, and you have the electron going around it kind of like a, a solar system. And so the, the first postulate is this electron is held in by the Coulomb force. Electron is held in in orbit by the Coulomb force. Okay, so that would mean that here's the force on him right here. We already know what the Coulomb is. If we look at the sum of the forces inward, because he's going in a circle, what was it? It was K Q1, we can either use K or 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. That's always a, I think I'm going to use the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught instead of the K. The charge of this, which is the charge of an electron, the charge of that, which is, if it's a proton, it has the same charge, so it's E squared. And it's inward, we already got the Midas in there, it's inward, all over R squared. So there's Coulomb's force, and when we're going in a circle, we set it equal to mv squared over r. Okay, so that's his first postulate right there. Postulate two is the, the angular momentum of the orbiting electrons, the angular momentum, momentum, of orbital electrons well first of all what's the equation for from uh, classical mechanics for angular momentum when we use the letter L I think the definition is really R cross P where Let's just say this thing's going around like that. There's your momentum, P. It's in the direction you're moving. R goes from here to here. So it's, remember, it's the magnitude of this times the magnitude of that times the sine of the angle between them. Well, R is this way. P is that way. The angle between them is 90 degrees. Sine of 90 is 1. So this is just R times P. I don't care about the direction. We already know it's out, but we don't care about the direction. And P is just mv. We're not using relativity. R times mv. He said this angular momentum is quantized. That is, 
it's, it can either be h, h over 2 pi or 2h over 2 pi or 3h over 2 pi dot 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 or nh over 2 pi. So he says that the angular momentum is quantized in units of h over 2 pi. Well, we're going to give another symbol for h over 2 pi. We're going to call it h bar. h with a little bar on it. Don't ask me where it is on the typewriter or the keyboard. It's just going to be defined as h over 2 pi. Pretty soon, this is the only one we're going to be using. We'll be getting away from h, and we'll be getting more into h divided by 2 pi. So this is nh bar. So by looking at this, this equation says that since the angular momentum is quantized, that means the radius is quantized. There are only certain discrete orbits here where n is equal to, say, 1, n is equal to 2, n equals 3. This n right here, this n, we're going to call it a quantum number. It's actually, right now, we'll call it our principal quantum number. Simple quantum number. Number. Okay, so that means that not only is the, the radius quantized now, but each one of these is going to have its own speed right there. We can calculate the speed. So that was the second one right here. Now the third one is, normally, how did we say we, we make radiation? We accelerate a charge. Well, this electron is accelerating, you got an which is v squared over r. He should be radiating, he should be losing energy, and he should spiral in. All electrons orbiting atoms are accelerating, they should be radiating, and all electrons orbiting atoms should spiral in. But he said that in this case, they don't, they don't lose energy. Orbiting electrons... Orbiting electrons don't lose energy. Don't lose energy. But if I put an electron on the end of a rope and swung it around, it would lose energy. But it doesn't do it here. We'll have to figure out why it doesn't, but he just said that. Okay, and then one more thing he said is, We'll see that when you calculate the energy here, because what do you got? You got kinetic and potential energy. You got kinetic and potential. Each one of these will have a different energy. And we can call this E1, E2, E3. These will all have higher and higher energies right here. And so we can say the fourth one is, when an electron jumps, when elect an electron jumps to a lower orbit, say it's in this orbit, and then it jumps to this orbit, jumps to a lower orbit, it emits energy right here. Why? Because you lost some. So, so it would be E sub this minus E sub that. That's how much energy you lost. So it would be E sub I, whatever the initial state is, minus E, the final state. And that's how much, how does it lose it? It loses it in the form of light. What does it do? It goes off to a photon, HF. Right here, where the frequency of that light would just be the difference divided by h. Right here. Now, so this is for dropping in energy. What about the opposite? Well, if you give it a photon with just enough energy to go from here to here, 
he'll say, I accept it. So this works both ways. He jumps to a lower orbit, he emits this, or if you give him just the right amount to go to a higher orbit, he'll accept it and jump up. So it works both ways right here. Now in, in, in uh, chemistry, they always say, well, electrons like to jump to the lowest orbit. And you might say, wait, why would, you, why would they always want to jump from here to here? The energy is still the same, it's just that when it's here, it's all in its orbit. When it's here, it's in a lower orbit, but you also have the photon. If you add up the energy of this plus the photon, it's the same energy of that. Why would it ever want to drop right here? Well, it's kind of like if you ever go to a farm, let's say there's a horse in a big corral. Here's a big corral he's in right here, but then next to it there's a little teeny cage right here where the horse can either run around there or he can run around here. Let's say you got a crazy horse that's constantly running. If you were to put the horse into that little spot, this is opened up, and then waited a little while and then came back, I guarantee you're going to find him over here. You're never going to find, put him here and probably find him over there if he's just running around crazy. Why? Because that's such a smaller area right there. Just statistically speaking, he should be over here. Well, it's the same thing with why the electron wants to drop to the low orbit. You see, when it's up in the high orbit, let's say, here's my orbits, let's say the electron is there. There's only one state. He's up in that second one. The other one, where he's down in the lower orbit, here's our atom, and now when he's in the lower orbit, the photon could be right there, the photon could be over here, the photon... So there's a lot of possibilities. For this case, there's only one possibility here. Here he's in this orbit, or he's in the low orbit and the photon's over here, or he's in the low orbit and the photon's over here, or over here, over here. So there's a lot of cases for this one. There's only one case for this, and if it has equally likely to be in any of them, it's always going to be in this lower one. It's almost like entropy right here. So this is the Bohr model of the atom, and now we'll go through, on the next lecture, we'll go through all of this, work it out, and hopefully we can prove this, and we can prove, I don't know, maybe some more stuff right here, all about the atom, just from this. It's still not a quantum, completely quantum theory, because this is classical. This is quantum. This looks like quantum, and so on, but this is still classical. We're still in that semi-classical range, and we've got our first quantum number, N.